My dog died in May of 2021, a few months after my spouse left, a few weeks after my car's alternator gave out in the middle of the desert somewhere. It was a time of my life when I really was living a country song. <laughs> Except I don't drive a Ford truck, and my dog was in a music video ready German Shepherd, but a one-eyed, surly, snoring, grunting Boston Terrier, prone to seizures and the kind of flatulence that I could strip paint. <laughs> Mona was a good dog, 14 when she died. She had been a constant through so many life stages. My ex and I had gotten her together about a year into our marriage during a particularly hard time. After we had our daughter, I remember Mona trying to constantly clean the baby because clearly we weren't licking our puppy enough. <laughs> Mona had gone blind in her left eye a few years back as she didn't produce enough tears on that side of her face. And then the year before her death, my then wife had come home to find her left eye gone, a bloody ruin. We think she'd scratched it out with her dewclaw. The vet sewed it up, but from then on, it seemed Mona was winking at us, no matter what was happening. Here she is with an advanced prosthetic. <laughs> Besides the loss of her eye, Mona's seizures had gotten worse that last year, too. They'd increased in frequency from once a year, maybe, to monthly, to weekly, to worse. The CBD chews had helped some, but it seemed like we, well, it wasn't we then, just I, as Mona lived with me and my ex was just an occasional visitor to pick up my daughter, were just playing whack-a-mole with symptoms and ailments. Even if one was treated, another popped up. I did what I thought of as a dog hospice. She was so constipated, I'd have to pull her along for miles long walks, hoping to get things moving. She'd put on the brakes for the first quarter mile. She was old and tired, but I tugged her along anyway to try to loosen her up so she could finally boop. The proverbial droughts alternated with monsoons. In the weeks before the end, she would have explosive diarrhea, and there were days and days of cleaning shit off my floor, off the furniture, off the walls. I remember laying with her on the floor, but not before I cleaned it really well. <laughs> uh, crying, uh, telling her in English she didn't speak, that it was okay if it was time for her to die. She didn't have to stick around for me, even if it meant I'd be alone like never before. I talked to my former vet tech friend about how I would know it was time. He said I would know once she lost her appetite, which reminded me of my Nana, who had done her damnedest to starve herself to an exit after she lost her husband, even as her adult children did everything they could to get her to eat. Mona lost her appetite. I talked to my ex, I talked to my kid, and even though there were tears, we agreed it was fi finally time. In so many ways, my dog had helped me raise my kid. My daughter's first word was dog. <laughs> my kid loves animals with love like a bludgeon, um, kind of like how George from Mice and Men Love Rabbits. <sighs> um, it, it takes a while to learn that even animals, even at their tamest, are not stuffed toys, but living beings that are communicating all the time, though they never speak a word. But Mona had always been so patient with Ellie. There were so many things my dog helped me uh, teach my kid how to listen, how to play, how to hike. There were laughs and silliness and love. There were so many gifts of having a dog and having this pet while I was raising my daughter. And ultimately, this included making her first acquaintanceship with death. Mona died in her sleep the day before the at-home euthanasia was scheduled. It was a last act of stubbornness. <laughs> One last gift, so I neither had to pay for her to be eased into death nor nagged by guilt that I had somehow killed her. She went out in her own way, at her own time, huddled by the door to my daughter's room, her body stiff and weirdly still. Splattered across the doorframe, like a fragrant Jackson Pollock, she had left one final spray of shit I had to clean. <laughs> Thank you.
we had a wake. <laughs> I put her body in a cardboard box. I bought donuts. My daughter and I picked hibiscus, which we scattered about the body. I couldn't get Mona's eye to close. My ex took my daughter to her place and said goodbye. Neighbors visited, told stories, and pet her fur end. And I sat with the corpse for a day, numb mostly, jamming out a deck building game on my Nintendo called Slay the Spire as I thought about life and death and what Mona had been to me and what was next and cried and glared at the TV trying to figure out how to get the damned ironclad class from the game I was busily pouring most of my attention in to work right. The whole time, from the corner of my eye, I kept expecting my dog to move. There was some small part of me that still thought this was all a mistake. That any second now, Mona would start lapping, wagging, living. But she never did. The corpse stayed as it was, a dead body. Sometime in the early afternoon, I felt something like a seat belt unbuckling in my heart. And there was a wind that moved through my apartment, and the front door opened and closed. When that happened, I finally stopped holding my breath because I was no longer waiting for Mona to stop holding hers. The next day, I buried my dog illegally, but not immorally, <laughs> in a secluded spot nestled in a canyon we used to hike that I know, but you wouldn't. <laughs> her body goes back to the soil, and her breath has gone wherever the ancestors went. Sometimes I visit her grave on my hikes. Life is many things, this singing of blood in our veins. Life is at times feasting, fucking, fighting, jockeying for status, reveling, wallowing, thrumming, bellowing, thundering. And even when we're not flush and hot, even when we are still as we can be, each pulse of our heart, each breath is an affirmation of life. Our lungs like bellows feeding a fire that lasts decades or even a century, but not forever. Because there's the other side of being a beast, an animal. The other side of being alive. I don't think it's a price to be paid, but instead the other part of this gift of being born. The gift of having a time to die, to let go, for the cessation of pain and struggle as we understand such things. Mona had a good death, one as free from pain as I could make it. She died in her sleep, with family, at home, mourned with plenty of those t time for those who loved her to sit with her body and for the living to let go. I wish this sort of death for everyone when their time comes. A few months back, I got a new puppy, a brindle mutt named Pringle, <laughs> that doesn't have much in common with Mona, save an equivalent stubbornness. Um, apparently, I have a type. Pringle vibrates with intensity, runs and plays rough and jumps and can't wait to get everything in her mouth. I'll probably outlive her too. But in the meantime, there are the scents on the wind. There's the taste of blood after losing another puppy tooth. There are games and fights and wounds to lick, triumphs and stories grand and small. Most days, there is being chased around and chasing an active eight-year-old whose first word was dog that begged for one year and a day till we finally found Pringle. And there's all this until she, like I, like all of us, will give her body back to the soil and send her breath wherever the ancestors went. I suspect when the time comes, it will feel like nothing so much as a seatbelt and fasting in my heart. John Pringle, everybody. John Perkins.